Hi everyone, today we will continue our lecture on calorimetry. So what we learned in the last class was about the calorimetry, what is it about? Basically it is about measuring heat, right? We measure heat rate production, uh, heat production rate sorry and total heat, right? Can give us information about all kinds of processes, whether uh, it is physical, chemical or biological. We looked at dif different processes and uh, saw the usefulness of calorimetry in giving us some insight about the changes which occur during the uh, process, right? Let me clarify a few things, I think a uh, few of uh, you may have some doubts about it. So yesterday we discussed about calculating the heat of hydration, right? So on the slide what we said was the total heat of hydration can be calculated as per this equation, right? And you see what is in this table that you have these compounds, right, C3S, C2S, C3S, C4F and also you have a coefficients associated with these A, B, C, D and for different times like 3 day, 7 day, 28 day, 90 day, 1 year, 6.5 years and 13 years. So if you have to calculate heat of hydration uh, after 3 days what would you do? You will use the coefficients for the 3 days, right? Um, and also you notice the coefficients are changing with time, right? So the coefficients you use 28 days are different than what you use for 3 days. So how was this relationship developed? That is the first thing. So these experiments were done long time back in 1950s by Copeland and his co-workers. What they did, they measure the heat of hydration at different time intervals, right? So you basically what you do, you plot heat versus time, right? And you have these data points for an example. This could be 3 day. 7 day, 28 day, right? So you measure this heat of hydration. In this particular study what they used is to measure uh, the heat of hydration at later ages like 28 days, 90 days, 1 year, they used the method of heat of solution. See the problem with conventional calorimetry is that the signal becomes really low uh, after few days, right? So I would say after 7 days for an example, you will not get strong signal. So the reaction slows down. So it is very hard to measure that, right? So at that time what they used, they used heat of solution. Uh, anyway, we will talk briefly about it. It is nothing but you are measuring, you are dissolving your sample in hydrofluoric acid uh, for an example. Uh, it could be a mixture of nitric acid and hydrofluoric acid also, okay? So you know that what is the heat of solution for your raw powder cement, right? And when it hydrates, suppose 50 percent of it has hydrated, you have 50 percent remaining unhydrated cement. So you use that sample to get the heat of solution for that. Now if you calculate the difference because you know the 100 percent cement, how much heat of solution it has and how much heat of solution is coming from 50 percent unhydrated cement, you can calculate the heat of uh, hydration for that particular time. So that is how they could measure because you cannot continue uh, doing the experiment for long time like 90 days, 1 year, 95. So that is just a background. So that if you are wondering like how did they calculate? heat of hydration at like after 13 years for an example. So they used, the, they prepared the samples and then collected those samples after 13 years for an example, calculate the heat of solution and by uh, subtracting it from the heat of solution of your cement, uh, raw 100% uh, cement, you can calculate the heat of hydration. So now you have this data where you are uh, plotting H which is heat of hydration versus time. Now we want to get a simplistic relationship, right, between this heat and the phase composition. So any particular cement, right, will have a particular phase composition. What do we mean by phase composition is it will have some C3S, C2S, C3A, C4A, right. And you know that to begin with how much C3S, how much C2S, C3A, C4A you have in the particular system. So, now you can do this optimization or you can use this least square method to calculate, okay, for this particular period, 3 day, I know my total heat and I know my C3S, C2S, C3A, C4A. 
So, what will be the combination of these coefficient a, b, c, d, right? It is simply least square uh, fit you can use to uh, get that. So, in that uh, work that is what they calculated. So, you get these numbers a uh, for 3 day, same thing you can apply for 7 day. So, you know the heat at 7 day, now you know the composition, you can calculate, you can again optimize that, right? See the changes, obviously it is reaction is taking place, you are seeing increase in total heat, so you will have a difference in the coefficients, understand right? Uh, so, how did we get this coefficient? So, what is interesting is like look at the coefficients you have after 13 years, right? So, you have a coefficient A is 510. B is 247, uh, C is 1356 and D is 427. They are very close, very close I would say to the values you have for these. This is the enthalpy of the complete hydration of these pure phases. Yesterday we discussed that if you hydrate pure C3S for an example, it tells you that it will release 517 kilojoule of heat right per kg right. So, see 510 is very close to 517 that makes sense because by then your reaction is almost complete, your reaction is almost complete if not 100 percent it is very close to 100 percent. So, it makes sense right these values are pretty close to what we have for the pure enthalpy for the pure phases ok. Hopefully, it uh, was helpful. Uh, primarily, we looked at different types of calorimeters, right? Uh, isothermal, adiabatic, semi-adiabatic. What is the difference? Isothermal, we try to uh, maintain constant temperature and adiabatic, we want to prevent the heat loss and if there is a heat loss, we want to minimize it, keep it very small and almost constant. In semi-adiabatic, the heat loss is not constant, it increases with the rise in temperature. Um, just important thing to uh, know that uh, you know you can use isothermal calorimeter only for small samples. We are talking about 1 to 100 gram right. So, it usually used for paste uh, or motor right and we are uh, also important thing to keep in mind you have a reference sample. It is very important to have a reference sample which has a similar heat capacity to that of your sample and we yesterday we looked into that how do you calculate the amount of reference sample you need right and you are measuring the difference between sample actual sample and reference sample right and we are getting this uh, thermal output this thermal power versus te temperature. Semi adiabatic we are insulating the sample completely insulating. So, you have this sample we because we want to prevent the heat loss right. So, we are completely insulating it and we are measuring the temperature. So, what the output of this is temperature versus time you have to convert it back if you want to calculate the heat of hydration by considering it to uh, like heat of heat capacity of uh, sample right. But the advantage of this technique is you can use it for concrete motors right large samples up to 10 kg can be used. But as we we know that as the temperature increases it also influences the hydration right because you are insulating and as a uh, consequence of cement hydration the temperature will increase and that will further influence your cement hydration. So, that is one thing you have to keep in mind. In adiabatic we are trying to minimize this heat loss by maintaining the temperature of su surrounding as close to your sample temperature right that is the difference. So, you have again the sample, but it is surrounded with a surrounding like you can use the water bath for an example. Suppose your temperature is increasing like concrete temperature is increasing by 1 degree, you are also increasing the temperature of water bath. So, that 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 is how you are minimizing this heat loss right and we saw that the kind of calorimeter we have at IIT Madras right. Uh, I would not go in detail yesterday we discussed it, it basically you are uh, sample right. Uh, you have a sample in this uh, uh, sample chamber and that chamber is uh, in this water bath right and we have a controller to uh, meaning uh, to control the temperature of the water bath right. You have a sensor which goes in the sample measures the temperature and then triggers the controller to again control the uh, uh, temperature of water bath. 
So, here we stopped yesterday, uh, we will look uh, closely. So, basically uh, let us compare three different types of calorimeters, right? isothermal, adiabatic and semi adiabatic. First look at the plot, the first plot where we are plotting temperature and time, right? So, isothermal obviously you, you are trying to maintain the temperature. So, isothermal will give you constant temperature, right? makes sense, in maybe in this case they use around 15 degrees Celsius. right? Now, what happens? You have the same temperature sensor in sample for a semi adiabatic case, you see increase in temperature, right? Why? Because we are trying to prevent the heat loss. Whatever heat is generated due to cement hydration, it is trapped, it is inside, right? So, it is giving rise to the temperature, right? In adiabatic, further you see higher temperature. Right. In semi adiabatic, you have higher losses, that is what we discussed. Right. You have losses, heat losses, but the uh, loss losses are higher because as you increase the temperature, also losses will occur, but at higher temperature, you will have higher losses. But in adiabatic, you do not have that much loss. So, you see the increase, the temperature is higher. Right. Similarly, we can correlate it to the thermal power. Right. Thermal power you see similar trend, this being the isothermal, right? this being um, semi adiabatic and this being adiabatic. Similar trends are there, that is what I want you to uh, focus right? and then we can integrate, integrate this, can calculate the heat because we know the power, power is joule per second right? and if you integrate over time what you will get is total heat. So, similar, so this is isothermal, semi adiabatic, adiabatic. So, see the difference, you have to, whenever you use a technique, idea is you need to know, you cannot compare, you need to know about the difference, the values you are getting for a particular technique. You cannot just compare result obtained from adiabatic and isothermal, right? That is the point, that is why, why you need to know what is the difference also how much is it okay so far we uh, looked into different calorimeters and what kind of uh, output we get now it's also important to look into the issues right we are getting some results but what are the problems challenges so we call it operational issues here i will start with isothermal calorimetry isothermal calorimetry we are trying to maintain the temperature right so it is very important to have a high precision thermostat, right? High precision thermostat is required to maintain constant temperature environment, it is very important. So, stable laboratory temperature will improve the precision of calorimetric measurements. For an example, you have calorimeter in a room and you want to do experiment at 22 degree Celsius for an example, right? And you have a room where the temperature is 40 degree Celsius, so that is not good that is simply. So, you have to have a stable laboratory temperature, also the temperature should be stable, it should not fluctuate, right? it should not have a huge difference also, and also the variation should be very low. The measurement of calibre, so now comes these uh, few things, we have to calibrate our calorimeter, very important. What do we mean by calibration? See, basically what we are doing in isothermal calorimetry is measuring the voltage. So, you have a reaction and suppose the reaction is exothermic, exothermic means heat is released. So, your sensor, heat flow sensor is picking it up because when there is heat, there will be temperature increase and the temperature increase can be related to the voltage, right? You have that sensor, now you have voltage. Now, you want to convert that voltage to power. So, you are converting this voltage for an example u to power right so the calibration coefficient simply is transforms the voltage from the heat flow sensor to thermal power so you have to get a appropriate calibration coefficient right how do you do it so first of all you want to make sure that when there is no reaction occurring what you say baseline you have to obtain baseline so you have to obtain a signal so you say u0 volt right from the calorimeter when there is no heat 
So, you have this reference baseline u0. Now, you know the u for an example when there is a reaction you will have some voltage. So, the difference between u and u0 will give you the contribution from the reaction. Now, this u minus u0 has to be related to p thermal power through this uh, calibration coefficient. That is what you should know for your calorimeter. Um, so, that is why it is always important to calibrate your uh, calibrate your uh, calorimeter when you have to change temperature for an example right for different conditions you cannot use same uh, calibration coefficient. These are some of, the, some of the issues people who work with calorimeter you will have to uh, make sure that you understand it and uh, calibrate it properly. Another thing is time constant. Time constant is nothing but is basically it is a thermal inertia simple way of understanding it is a thermal inertia right. So, you want to suppose give some power right, but if you measure it actually you would not suppose like for an example you have a uh, you suppose this is the input right you want to raise the power, but in actual case it may be like this right it would not go immediately to. So, there is always some lag it is because of thermal inertia right. Uh, so, it is needed for rapidly changing processes when you are uh, when the process is very rapid suppose we are looking at early age hydration early age hydration means within hours what is happening when cement is reacting right those kind of things it is very important to pay attention to time constant. But if you are looking at the main peak for an example which occurs at around 10 to 14 hours which we saw yesterday uh, when we looked into Portland cement hydration you may not uh, you may not need uh, this time constant, but it is important because the measure of thermal inertia of the sample it gets blurred like it influences your rapid events. We will go more in detail basically what is it is this time constant you can relate. So, we can use this T n equation right where we have P c for an example is the corrected thermal power you want to get the correct thermal power equals to P plus this tau d p over d t. So, we are interested in getting this tau which is the time constant right. So, again this equation can be used to correct the rapid processes for the time lag of an instrument especially important when you are looking at rapid processes and any rapid process or early age hydration of cement early age hydration later age hydration like if you are talking about days uh, it may not matter. Time can constant can be calculated using this equation. So, we see tau equals to summation of all heat capacities. So, sigma c is like heat capacity on the sample side of heat flow sensor. We are talking about you have a sample in container we call it ampule and you have a ampule holder also. So, it is the summation of heat capacities of sample ampule ampule holder upon k, k is parent thermal conductance of the heat flow sensor. You have a sensor heat flow sensor you know the conductance right. So, that uh, you can calculate uh, time constant. So, again I have just to uh, keep in mind time con uh, Tn equation is not needed in the study of slow processes like the main hydration of cement, but it is very useful right in the study of early hydration and other rapid processes ok. So, a few practical notes right uh, we have learnt now what do we get from isothermal calorimetry right. Also uh, what is the limitation in terms of like what kind of samples can we analyze also it is important to pay attention to some a few practical notes. So, it is important to use proper reference which have similar heat capacity as the sample, but no heat generation very important for isothermal calorimeter and yesterday we saw that how do we do that you have to calculate the thermal mass right by taking into account specific heat capacities of your uh, material which you are using like for an example if you want to study cement paste you have cement and water you know the heat capacities of cement and water you can calculate the total heat capacity like uh, you can calculate the thermal mass right. Then you want to have equal thermal mass. So, you know the heat capacity of your uh, reference um, material uh, yesterday we looked into the water, but you can also use quads right. So, you can then you can basically uh, have similar heat capacity right. Now, we are saying that 
the reference also has similar heat capacity, but it does not generate heat, uh, it is not there is no reaction that is important. So, very important for the same sample size and the same water cement ratio that the references do not need to be changed. If you are using the same water cement ratio for an example and same size right. Uh, so, you may not have to use the uh, you know you may not need to change references. Change references for different sample size, now you decide to change the sample size, you are saying okay, I will use 3 gram of cement paste versus 5 gram of cement paste, then your thermal mass will change, thermal mass will change that means your reference also has to be changed. So, you have to do those calculations before you start the experiment, these are few practical notes you have to keep in mind. If baseline stabilization takes long time more than half a day, this could be due to bad reference. So, these are some signals you can get, so you have to first get this baseline stabilization right. If it is taking long time that means there is some issue, you have not chosen your reference correctly or maybe the amount of reference is different, is not correct. Also you have to keep in mind most of the time we, what we do, we mix sample outside right. You suppose you decide to study the cement paste hydration, uh, cement hydration and you are making cement paste, you are mixing it outside for few minutes then you keep it in the calorimeter right, but that creates some disturbance. So, early external mixing influence right influences initial values of heat of hydration because you are not mixing it at inside at control environment, you are mixing it outside right. So, usually when you do that you, you it is good to ignore the initial 30 minutes of 30 minutes of data right. Suppose you mix the sample outside, put it inside then first 30 minutes because there is some influence of the external mixing. But these days you can also get isothermal calorimeter where you can mix samples inside. So, you condition your samples, you put cement only and water only at particular temperature and it will mix. In that case you can, you do not have to ignore the data because you are getting the reliable data. So, these are the few things you have to keep in mind. Uh, what are the issues with semi adiabatic calorimetry right, so, temperature stability again it is very important to have temperature stability and accuracy. It is very crucial when the heat of hydration uh, need to be quantified right and better control of temperature fluctuation air flow around calorimeter is required. So, it is very important also what is the temperature of surrounding where your calorimeter is placed. That is why you need to have a stable room where you can control the temperature, you cannot just keep in a room where the temperature is not controlled, very important that influences both measurements of isothermal calorimeter and also uh, of semi adiabatic calorimeter. Calibration in this case uh, semi adiabatic calorimeter uh, is complicated and time consuming right, requires what it what does it require, basically you have to measure the heat loss. In semi adiabatic again if you uh, check I mean if you look back you are insulating your sample right, you are insulating your sample and you are measuring the temperature. The main thing is the is the heat loss even if you are insulated there is going to be some heat loss and that heat loss will change like uh, if the temperature is 100 degrees Celsius for an example the heat loss will be higher than the temp when the temperature was 60 degrees Celsius. So, you have to understand this heat loss for that you have to calibrate it. So, it requires measurement of electrical energy for maintaining a constantly increasing temperature of a calibration cylinder. What you do? You have this calibration cylinder, you give it some electrical energy right uh, to maintain this uh, increase in temperature. Now, you turn it off, you turn it off then you measure the heat loss, temperature loss right that is how you will be able to calculate the heat loss and also you can use that to calculate the heat capacity. So, heat loss coefficient right and the heat capacity of the calorimeter uh, need to be determined. So, these are the steps for calibration and uh, what about the sample preparation for isothermal calorimeter right. So, we need to always make sure we have a homogeneous space in it, homogeneous very important. So, uh, if you are talking about the paste right you want to make sure you get a sample which is the representative right. So, um, similar thing applies to motor also, it is very important for these kind of studies. So, it is important to have multiple samples right and making sure that the samples are 
uh, homogeneous, right. Also, we have to weigh the constituents in vial and the mix outside inside the vial with a uh, plastic uh, sp spatula. What you do? You have these small vials, right? You weigh the vials and you put your constituents in the vial, small vial, right? Um, and weigh the like. Then you will know how much of uh, suppose cement you want to use. You are weighing the cement, right? And then you are adding water for an example. Then you are mixing it, right? The internal mixing in the calorimeter preferred for better studying initial hydration. As I said, because if you want to look into the hydration occurring within one hour, then you have to go for internal mixing. You cannot go for external mixing. Then you have to put your cement and water in the calorimeter and uh, use the mixing, uh, use the internal mixing. But also you have to, uh, it is important to pay attention that the mixing energy influences the hydration, right. So, suppose you decide to mix it outside, right and you mix it for 2 minutes, someone else mixes for 3 minutes, that will have a different mixing energy and here is the influence of the mixing energy. See if you see this plot where we are plotting the heat flow, right versus time. One is hand mixed sample, one is mixed at 1600 rpm, we controlled it. See the difference? So, when you have 1600 rpm, you accelerate the hydration, accelerate, you see that the curve also moves towards left, right. So, mixing rate can influence the hydration rate, very important. So, it is very important to have a similar protocol all the time. If you do not, small change will influence because this technique is very sensitive. As we saw that we are talking about milli, uh, milli watts, like actually you can measure up to nanowatts, right. But uh, small signal can be uh, sensed. Hydration rate is increased at high, higher mix, mixing energy, that is what you see here. That is why it is important to maintain constant mixing for comparison. Like if you have few samples, how do you compare? You have to make sure that you are following the same mixing procedure in terms of energy, okay. You do not want to mix one sample for 2 minutes, another for 2 and half and next one for 3 minutes, not for this kind of study. That will significantly influence the data, okay. 